Studio Ghibli's 2014 film When Marnie Was There adapts Joan Robinson's 1967 novel of the same name. For almost six years, this film was Studio Ghibli's swan song, which is kind of funny, because if they had just not made it, they could have gone out on a high note with the tale of Princess Kaguya. The film follows Anna, a lonely and anxious young girl who's sent away by her foster mother to a seaside town in the hopes that she'll become less sad and withdrawn and depressed. A strategy that works! Send me away on a vacation, Mom! I'll be better, I promise! Anna struggles to socialize without spiraling into panic attacks or lashing out at people until she meets Marnie, a mysterious girl who hangs around her parents' summer mansion while they neglect her. They run off to play a lot, and they leave her in the care of the house's abusive maids, which is fine. Anna comes to learn in between her late-night rendezvous with Marnie that Marnie is actually a ghost. Her romance with Marnie has a tragic lair, where being with Marnie is helping Anna find her footing and stabilize her emotions, and yet, they can't be together because Marnie is dead. And when I say romance, I do mean romance. So much has been said about the rowboat scene where Marnie gets behind Anna and tutors her in rowing. The constant blushing. And Anna's jealousy when Marnie dances with her intended slash boyfriend childhood friend Kazuhiko. And that is so important, but there's a whole other layer to this queer love story that I haven't seen anybody talking about. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you the filmmakers did seemingly everything in their power to communicate to the viewer that these two characters are in love. They baked the gay into the film's symbolism at a very crucial moment in the story. And this would just be a cool fun fact analysis video, except for the part where there's incest! I forgot to mention, Marnie is Anna's fucking grandma. It's true, before going into foster care, Anna was raised by her grandmother, who was Marnie in Marnie's old age. There are only two hints leading up to this. The first is that one kid tells Anna that her eyes have a little blue in them, which is like, I guess, supposed to tip us off to the fact that Anna has foreigner genes. <laughs> and then again later, when Marnie confuses Anna for Kazuhiko, who, as you can probably guess, is Anna's grandfather, Marnie's eventual baby daddy. Yes. <laughs> I first watched this film in 2014, and while I'm trying to black that year out from my memory, the stain of this reveal will never wash away. I was never really a loner growing up, but I was a perpetually humiliated, awkward, edgelord 12-year-old once upon a time. Some valiant souls try to paint the relationship that Marnie and Anna have as platonic, because it can't possibly be romantic, because Marnie is Anna's grandma, and you poor babies are doing the best that you can to save the rest of us from the ego death that this film is certain to precipitate. But here's the thing. I think that tactic avoids dealing with the facts at hand. On one hand, this film reads overtly as a gay love story. On the other, this is a film about a child and her ghost grandmother. This video is going to be my way of dealing with this ending, and I hope to show you that when films do inexplicably weird things like this, it's worthwhile to talk about why. So the twist ending ruined things. It dashed against the rocky shore of reality many viewers joy at connecting to a story about queer girls who don't fit in because they haven't quite figured out who they are, and they feel different. This is an authentic and rich depiction of depression and 12-year-olds, and the process of maturing into one's sexuality. I love that Anna has an emotional landscape beyond pleasantly amused. Like, she's got flaws and she's unreasonable sometimes, 
she's lonely, but she keeps driving people away. She's the architect of her own misery. You bet I am. And Anna's going through some shit. Like, it sucks to be a preteen. She's waking up to her latent sexual desires, and she's depressed as shit, but she hasn't really found a way to have meaning in her life. When I watched this again recently, I was totally decalibrated. I couldn't work out how we went from a quaint little love story to incest so quickly. It felt like I had crossed over into a different time zone that was just an hour different. Like, things were mostly the same, but they felt a little bit crooked. If you've ever wanted to know what it's like to be a student in literature or media studies or cinema studies, I'll give you a preview here. Class, what's this image? Genitals. Okay, cool. On to your three. We are a people very concerned with genitals. And it sounds silly, but think about it. You probably see genitals where you don't expect to see them all the time. Go check out r slash mildly penis and you'll find a whole community that's come together around this kind of exercise. So let's just think about what symbolism is for a second. Symbolism is the confusing manifestation of the interstices between the conscious and the subconscious. In simpler terms, it's a way of representing the stuff that we know we think about and the stuff that we aren't aware that we think about at all. Symbolism influences how we see the world and how we see the world influences how we symbolize it. At some point in the history of the world, phallic symbols, that is, symbols of the penis, started to connect ideas about masculinity and power with the dick genital. I'm gonna say penis a lot. We're gonna be mature about it. Swords and guns that are kind of placed right around the pelvis and illustrations start to associate ideas about power and penetration with, like, the penis and its associations, like fertility, reproduction, and again, in this case, masculinity. Our brains take all those associations and they mix them around, and then for better or for worse, swords start to look kind of sexual, and then penises start to look kind of powerful. This even leaks into architecture. Like, how many times have you seen jokes on TV where towers are associated with penises? Interestingly, though, a phallic-looking tower can convey an idea of insecurity, like masculinity that's under threat. Because, unfortunately, we associate masculinity with big penises. And so, when you get a big tower with a round top... I also just have to say, by the way, if you're thinking this doesn't account for trans people, you're totally right. A lot of the way that we talk about these images was influenced by Sigmund Freud, who was more interested in figuring out if we wanted to all fuck our dads than he was with developing the most comprehensive scientific framework. So probably some of you have thought about shounen anime and the big swords that some characters have that are placed, like, right around fucking the pelvis, like, Tetsuiga! However, there's a shoujo anime that I think is a really helpful point of comparison when we're talking about Marnie, Revolutionary Girl Tenna. And the main reason that I think this is because I have a friend who is an expert in Utena who could assist me with this. So I'm going to give you a reductive uh, breakdown of what Utena is about. How do I fucking do this? Utena likes to wear boys' uniforms and she dreams one day of becoming a prince. Throughout the show, she has to beat a bunch of people in sword fights for Anthe, who stores a sword inside her chest. Take that, Marie Kondo! I don't need to throw it away if it doesn't spark joy. I can keep it inside me until it does! For a significant portion of the show, Anthe is trapped in a sexual servitude to Akio, her brother, in this huge tower. Utena, the kickest ass, plays the part of the prince rescuing Anthe from her prison. And listen, there's mildly penis and then there's overtly penis, and this falls pretty clearly on the latter end. The penis tower is symbolic. It's not just supposed to be a funny design. <laughs> the tower is the gateway, or the threshold, between adolescence and adulthood. Utena is, in some ways, naive. She knows that Akio's relationship with Anthe is wrong, and yet she can't really do anything to stop it. She knows that, you know, you could don't have to be straight, you can be your little queer self. And yet, what she doesn't understand, and what Akio tells her is that she's naive, maybe idealistic, to assume that she can single-handedly dismantle this structure that's been in place for so much longer than she's been aware of it. As she grows up, as she goes up the tower, Utena has to come to terms with the way that straightness is hammered into every level of society. In the adult world, there will be a societal pressure to observe and obey gender norms. She already experiences it in the school when she wears a boy's uniform. <laughs> Hentekou? Hentekou. 
男子はみんな似たような格好してますよあなたは女子だからなぜ男子の制服を着ているのですか But the outside world will not be so gentle about trying to iron out the gay in you. As Utena climbs the penis tower, she's working up to sexual maturity and she's dealing with straight people's society trying to wear her down and enculturate her into straightness. She has to go through it. She has to come to terms with the way that her sexuality is going to change the way the world treats her in order to grow up. You can see why the tower isn't shaped like a vulva. The fact that it's a penis and Akio has a penis is telling you who's in power with a particular kind of body. The original series and the film have different endings. In the series, Utena doesn't manage to escape the tower, which is grim, because it shows that some people just can't keep fighting. Maybe for some people, for many people, it's just not possible to be their authentic queer little self in all of their glory. In the film, though, Utena rescues Anthe, and then she turns into a car, and Anthe rides her to freedom? So, the tower, like Akio, represents the looming, overwhelming expectations of heteronormativity. That's a big word, but it basically just means the idea that straightness is the norm, that gayness is aberrant or abnormal. The ending to the film and the ending to the series present the two possible outcomes optimistically, freedom, and pessimistically, defeat, futility. By conquering the penis tower, Utena conquers gender norms, becoming a self sufficient prince slash princess and rescuing her woman loving lover from her imprisonment. The penis tower is the crucible for queer women to enter and become who they were always meant to be, and the, the only way to get out is for them to be together. The key is queer love! Okay, so like, just keep the penis tower in mind when I tell you what I'm about to tell you. Okay, so I'm gonna call this section the silo. Marnie gets stuck in a silo at one point. When we first see the silo, the camera starts at the base and strokes, sorry, pans up to the head, sorry, top of the tower. This is a penis silo. Don't deny it, just know it. Marnie explains that the maids who are in charge of taking care of her forced her into the silo at one point and that traumatized her. Anna and Marnie agree to go into the silo together so Anna can be a supportive presence, but they're separated because Anna sucks. She goes into the tower to retrieve Marnie. This is the moment of truth for the two of them. Like Utena climbing the penis tower, Anna has to brave the challenge to grow up. And you can tell things are changing. Marnie is distressed and confused. Anna is growing up falling into Marnie's old role as the self-assured, confident one, Anna is tasked with leading Marnie out of the tower. Something stops them from being able to do that, though. The pair can't leave, and they're stuck in the silo until Kazuhiko enters. He calms Marnie down, and he leads her out, leaving Anna in the silo. The two girls are trapped in the penis tower. They cannot get out. A boy has to come into the tower and extract Marnie out of it. The girls are separated. Their love is over. This is a capsule version of Marnie's wider journey of growing up. She leaves with Kazuhiko, exits her queer childhood, and enters into straightness, straight society. And she leaves her girlfriend behind! The silo represents the process of integration into adult society and, therefore, heteronormativity. From a really young age, girls are exposed to media that frames deep, steadfast relationships between girls as immature. Like, they're secondary to the marriage that you're gonna have with a dude. So you're taught really early on to view the real relationships you have with other women as secondary to a hypothetical one that you are bound to have later in the future. This inevitable husband figure is going to come and supersede the girlfriends you have in importance. In the novel, Marnie and Anna lie in some grass and talk about love before Marnie says that she never wants to grow up and then explains that Kazuhiko, Edward in the novel, wants her to go into the silo, which is actually a windmill, so just keep that in mind for later. So the novel lines up three ideas and the movie follows through with this. Love, coming of age, and the windmill. For Marnie to grow up, she has to retread old traumatic ground. She has to enter the windmill as a little girl who likes girls and walk out as a woman who's bound to a man. She can't do that with Anna. It's almost physically impossible because Marnie's context demands her to be with Kazuhiko, whether she's bi or straight or totally lesbian. It's the rules. It's inevitable. 
The other options aren't allowed. They're imaginary games that you play as a child before falling into line. Marnie's arc is analogous to Anthe's in some ways. She's stuck within this paradigm and she just can't get out. And there's somebody else who's a bit more butch who's charged with trying to get her out. And Anna, therefore, is a little bit like Utena. Now, okay, I'm not saying this is a reference to Utena, okay? But I want you to compare Marnie and Utena side by side. The fact that a queer girl who doesn't quite fit in, who has a special connection with another girl, goes in and may or may not come out with her. That adulthood is linked to going into the tower. The incest! Marnie is... Anna's grandma. Whether that's on purpose or not, it's a pattern. It puts Marnie up on the same shelf as other anime about queer girls. Like, if they wanted this film to be obviously platonic, they could have done something about this. The phallic quality of the windmill is toned down compared to the silo in the movie. And that's because it's not a fucking silo, it's a windmill! The added detail of the turbines just makes the whole thing so much less shafty. And while in the book, the windmill is still the place where Marnie and Anna's relationship goes to die, it's not as magnified as it is in the film. Marnie is Anna's grandma. Okay, so now you're probably thinking, because I framed this video with this part, what are we gonna do about that whole incest conundrum? And the sad part about that incest thing is that we can't solve it. In CJ the X's hilarious video on this subject, they lay the issue to rest by saying that in our hearts, Marnie and Anna get together, and that's how it can be. Uh, and nobody can take that away from each of us, and I think that that is a good way to preserve our sanities. Also, I can't show their face around here anymore because they are significantly funnier than me, and I can't keep making myself look bad by showing people whose content is better than mine. This separates the romance that we hapless weebs were sucked up into from the actual facts of the film, which is that Marnie is Anna's grandma. The incest twist retroactively defines queer love as friendship. Like, once you see that ending, it's really hard to go back and look at what happens as love without feeling very uncomfortable. I prefer CJ the X's approach to saying the romance didn't exist at all. Like, saying the romance wasn't there because if it were, it would be incestuous gives us a comfortable route away from an uncomfortable reality. Sometimes a movie has a contradiction and we can't work around it. And that's because it was made by people, and that is why Freud had a career, and also so much cocaine. So somebody fucking falls in love with their grandma's ghost. It's important to acknowledge that and try to figure out how that might change things. How does this influence the movie's themes? How does it undermine them? How does it amplify or strengthen them? To work that out, we might have to think about the original book's context. So in the 1960s, when Joan Robinson wrote this book, society may not have been as accepting of a love story between two children that was delivered to children. In that way, the plot twist guards against homophobic criticism, like it's a red herring for the straights or the homophobes to look at. On the other hand, though, when Ghibli adapted this film, <laughs> They made choices in visualizing it that added extra gay flavors to the narrative. They didn't have to make the windmill into a silo, is what I'm saying. And, you know, the other thing is, if they wanted to, Ghibli could have gotten rid of the grandma reveal. They could have just made Marnie into a horny ghost, and it would have been so much less strange! And, you know, I said that 1960s society wouldn't have been as accepting of Joan Robinson's story if it were explicitly gay. And, but the truth is, I don't know if... Society, global society anywhere in 2014 would have been that much more open-minded. I can't really think of a place where there's room in my country even now for LGBT narratives about gay kids for gay kids. And I'm thinking about the freakouts people had about queer kid stuff just a couple of years ago on YouTube. We have such a long way to go in making room for gay kids. Never mind stories about gay kids. Some things haven't really changed since Robinson's book released. Then again, again... Uh, maybe the filmmakers just didn't know what was going on here. <laughs> a lot of people genuinely look at things like this and they think, like, platonic friends, that's what friendship is. It's just blushing and being jealous and totally in love. Women loving women's romance needs to scream out its status as a romance before anybody will even consider that it's not platonic. And so some people will accidentally create really queer shit because sometimes really straight stuff 
can be a deconstruction of itself and can end up being homoerotic. <laughs> Then again, 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 I just have a hard time thinking that Ghibli didn't know what was going on here because their movies have always been so in tune with the nuances of women's lives and experiences. Like when I want to feel like somebody gets it, I go to Ghibli's films and also the 2005 adaptation of Pride and Prejudice because that hand scene. Darcy. Miss Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy! <laughs> so they had to have known. They had to have known. They had to. They had to have known, right? This is what I'm saying. We can't know why this twist is in here without seeing a bunch of diaries that we don't really know exist or getting a peek into side, into side people's brains. Maybe one day there will be a reason. With evidence and proof, these are coming off my head now. For now, all we have is the incest, without explanation. And it's a dizzying twist, but it's one that we've got to confront, even if that confrontation is inconclusive. Patrons, thank you so much to my patrons who keep me alive and feed me. I am their hamster. I cared so much that this time I alphabetized your names, so thank you so much. Erdrich, Remy, Joseph Abrams, Josera Riveter, Pat Heavily, Sheldon W, Shudreji, and Thomas. I hope you appreciate having your names <laughs> annihilated. <laughs>